So, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. A very good afternoon and welcome to our first webinar called International Armed Conflict in Kashmir. So, we're honored to have the distinguished speakers present today here who are renowned experts on the Kashmir conflict. Before we would, uh, introduce our speakers, I would like to highlight a few important uh, dimensions of the multifaceted uh, conflict. The Kashmir dispute has a source of uh, conflict between India and Pakistan. It has been a source of a conflict between India and Pakistan ever since the first Indo-Pak War of 1948. Moreover, India and Pakistan have fought two major wars over Kashmir. It's uh, 1965 and uh, Kargil War of 1999. In addition, uh, there's no end to the uh, escalations upon the line of control. Uh, as we know, since uh, 2013, the escalation has increased. The friction not only continues, but has increased. If we refer to the recent uh, war report, a uh, war report published by the uh, Geneva Academy on the uh, law of armed conflict, there has been a, uh, reportedly, there have been uh, 35 in 2017, there have been 35,000 peoples who flee and there was at least 83 soldiers and civilians were death, uh, were killed. In 2017, heavy shelling reportedly led the evacuation of 1,700 peoples along the line of control. Ceasefire violation continued in 2018, which, uh, in which 182 peoples were killed and 314 peoples injured due to the clash between military uh, <coughs> armed forces. So when we look, uh, 2019, it was a year of uh, volatile and turbulence. Uh, even Pakistan accused uh, India of using the banned cluster bombs uh, in line of control, uh, uh, this LOC. Yet, what is uh, India called this Kashmir issue, uh, a domestic problem and internal matter, even some uh, other, uh, this international community, they call it an in India's internal matter. But the fact is, India is forcibly uh, placing more than 7 lakh troops in the from the last 72 years which uh, completely disregard the kashmir's inalienable right and unexhaustible right of the self determination uh, which has been guaranteed by the united nations by way of 11 uh, security council resolutions the this would not only characterize the kashmir conflict as a case of the illegal military occupation but uh, also a case of the prolonged military occupation uh, I, I would uh, uh, like to refer one of the uh, the resolution of the security council here it was uh, in the, the united nations security council used the term of prolonged uh, military occupation in reference to the occupation of uh, this palestine after the 13 years since the start of the said occupation so by virtue of it would not be exaggeration to call qualify 73 years military occupation of a kashmir as one of the most unprecedented uh, case of the prolonged military occupation in the modern era. Like indigenous Kashmiris, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're fighting continuously, they're fighting uh, from past 73 years. It's not uh, that they're fighting right from the insurgency 19, but uh, they're fighting from the last 73 years uh, for their right of self-determination, which has been guaranteed, guaranteed by the United Nations. This occupation has adopted a very brutal uh, and ugly reality in 1989, which is very important uh, in the, today in the discussion. Since the start of the Kashmiri Armed Liberation Movement, uh, which was in the self-defense and in response to the military occupation, because India was involved in the heinous war crimes uh, like extrajudicial killings, tortures, inhuman inhuman treatment, rape, sexual violence, and use of banned illegal weapons, like they have then the, the, the Black Laws in Place, uh, the Armed Force Special Powers Act, which gives the uh, Armed Force absolute impunity to kill or arrest without a warrant. So uh, today's discussion will focus on the Kashmir dispute and whether the Kashmir conflict meets the threshold of the international armed conflict and the status of the liberation armed uh, movements of the indigenous Kashmiris for fighting for the right of self-determination. So, and lastly, we turn to the uh, we would be talking to the impact of the conflict of the Kashmiris and its available uh, remedy in the uh, revolving crisis. So we have with us uh, four distinguished. Uh, uh, speakers. So first is uh, Mr. 
Dr. Mohammed Mushtaq, uh, Mr. Mohammed Mushtaq, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Mohammed Mushtaq is Director General of Area Academy, International Islamic University, Islamabad. He has done his PhD in Islamic law and jurisprudence, and LLM and uh, L uh, his LLM dissertations were on the legitimacy of the armed liberation uh, struggle in Islamic law and international law. He is the author of several books and research articles, which include the Hudud Law Critical Review of the Report of Council of Islamic Ideology, uh, Jihad, Resistance, and Rebellions in Islamic and Modern International Law, International Humanitarian Law in Islam, Transaction of the Geneva Convention, and Additional Protocol. Presently, he is serving five PhD dissertations on the various aspects of the constitutional law and international law. So our second uh, uh, speaker uh, would be uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador Ashraf Jahangir Qazi. He is a Pakistani diplomat. He has uh, held several national and international appointments, including serving with the United Nations. He has served as a high commission to United States, India, Syria, East Germany, Russia, and Syria, and also in China. In 2004, Secretary, uh, Secretary General of United Nations appointed Mr. Kazi as the head of the UN mission in Iraq. In 2007, he was named as a special representative of the UN Secretary General in the Sudan, South Sudan. And uh, then we have Justice Ali Nawaz Chohan, a uh, reputed international judge. Uh, he's, uh, he started as a district judge uh, in Pakistan. From to, to 2006, he was a judge uh, for Yugoslavia Tribunal for three years. He has been judged for UNESCO. He has served uh, as the Chief Justice of uh, Gambia and uh, was appointed as the first chairman of the National Commission for Human Rights. Uh, moreover, Mr. Justice Ali Noah Chohan is uh, our honorary chairman of Legal Forum for Kashmir uh, from 2019. And then we have a very renowned and very enthusiastic uh, personality, Dr. Uh, Gulam Nabi Fai. Uh, Dr. Gulam Nabi Fai is the Secretary General of the World Kashmir Awareness uh, Washington based firm and the founding chairman of London based Juristic uh, Justice Foundation, International Institute of Kashmir Studies. Dr. Fai holds uh, his PhD in mass communication from Temple University, US, and master's from Aligarh Muslim University. Uh, among the Kashmiri diaspora, Dr. Fai is a uh, regular organizer and uh, mover behind the Kashmir related activities. So I thank you all of you uh, once again. So we'd we'll, we'll, uh, start our session uh, with uh, Dr. Muhammad Bushtaq uh, and uh, would love, uh, uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Saab, on this, uh, the military occupation, as well as this, uh, if this conflict meets the threshold of the international armed conflict or not. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Nasir Qadri, sir. Uh, I hope my, uh, you, you are hearing me? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nasir Saab, and uh, I'm really grateful to this forum, legal forum for the voices of the oppressed, uh, oppressed voices of Kashmir. And it indeed is an honor to share this panel with such dignitaries as Ambassador Ashraf Jahangir Qazi Sahib, uh, Honorable Justice uh, Ali Nawaz Chohan Sahib, whom we all consider as one of our great teachers, and also with uh, Dr. Ghulam Nabi Fai Sahib. So this is indeed an honor and uh, God has been very gracious to me always uh, because uh, I have been working on the issue of Kashmir and self-determination uh, for so many years. I, as you already mentioned, I worked in my LLM dissertation on the use of force for the right of self-determination, but later on I had the opportunity to supervise a few PhD thesis as well on uh, Kashmir issue, various aspects of Kashmir issue. One of them was by Dr. Idris Abbasi Sahib, uh, which uh, is about the internal aspect of self-determination. And another one by Sardar Wakar Sahib, uh, which is about uh, uh, the human rights obligations of the government of Azad Jammu and Kashmir. And presently I'm also supervising a thesis of Raja Sajjad Sahib and Ashraf Qureshi Sahib who are working on other aspects relating to Kashmir issue. So it indeed is an honor and a great responsibility as well. Uh, in this session, I will uh, try to explain that uh, this Kashmir dispute 
uh, not only meets the threshold of international armed conflict, rather it is an international armed conflict par excellence. Uh, for that purpose, of course, I will focus on international humanitarian law, some of the provisions of the Geneva Conventions and additional protocols, uh, also some general principles of international humanitarian law. But before that, I would like to say words about the right of uh, self-determination uh, because the whole issue revolves around the right of self-determination. And also, uh, I will try to explain why the international community uh, has not been uh, fulfilling its responsibilities as far as the right of, uh, right, right of uh, our Kashmiri brethren is concerned, right to self-determination. So to begin with, I will refer to the speech of uh, Woodrow Wilson, which he gave in 1917. Uh, I am quoting a few words from that uh, very famous speech because there are three points and these three points actually give us the whole idea of the right to self-determination. So I quote, we believe first that every people has a right to choose the sovereignty under which it shall live. Second, that the small states of the world have a right to enjoy the same respect for their sovereignty and for their territorial integrity that the great and powerful nations expect and insist upon. Third, that the world has a right to be free from every disturbance of its peace that has its origin in aggression and disregard of the right of peoples and nations. These three points actually give us the whole idea of self-determination. And they also explain that peace is not possible if you continue to deny this right to peoples. Uh, and that is what Woodrow Wilson explicitly stated in that speech where he says, and I quote, no peace can last or ought to last, which does not accept the principle that governments derive all their just powers from the consent of the governed and that no right anywhere exists to hand people from sovereignty to sovereignty as if they were property. So people are not like property which can be handed over from one sovereignty to another. Uh, this is the crux of the matter. And uh, then we have the famous 14 points of Woodrow Wilson in which he further talked about the right to self-determination for certain people, of course, in the European context. Uh, also, one can talk about the ideas of Lenin uh, who talked about self-determination not only for European people, but also for Asia and Africa. And even the uh, Soviet constitution, Article 72, uh, acknowledged the right of the people to secede, the right of the constituent republics to secede from the union. Although practically that might not be possible, the very, but the very idea that uh, these uh, constituent republics could secede from the union, that was very uh, fascinating and disturbing as well for some of the people. And that is why the US Secretary of State at that time uh, he thought that this would be destructive to the stability of the future world if you continue to apply the right to self-determination to the colonial world. Now, herein lies the problem. That when it comes to European powers, when it comes to Western people, they all were supportive of the right to self-determination. But when you talk about the right to self-determination for colonial, the colonial world, for the colonies, for the people of the colonies, for those who were under alien domination, then these same Western powers would call it disturbing uh, and destructive to the stability of the world. This is the dilemma in which uh, the international community has been caught from the very beginning. Uh, skipping some other details, I would like to come to the Atlantic Charter of 1941, which was adopted by the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom on August 14, 1941. Among other things, it says, and I quote, they desire to see no territorial changes. They do not accord with the freely expressed wishes of the people concerned, unquote. Interestingly, later on, Winston Churchill said that this was uh, specifically about Europe only. 
So there is the kind of double standards we are talking about. Uh, and the same phenomenon one can see uh, when the UN Charter was being drafted and uh, the issue was whether to include the right to self-determination there or not. Uh, Belgium and some other Western powers specifically objected to these provisions. Anyhow, they were included in Article 1, sub Article 2 among the objectives of the UN Charter. Uh, and, and there are some other provisions as well, but they were diluted uh, by some other provisions. Now, you uh, have already talked about the Kashmir, uh, uh, resolutions about Kashmir, resolutions of the UN Security Council, but I will refer here to general uh, resolutions uh, which were given by the, which were adopted by the UN General Assembly. Uh, more import, most importantly, this uh, resolution number 1514 adopted in 1960 in the 25th year of, uh, in the 15th year. Um, the declaration, uh, this is the declaration on granting independence to colonial territories and peoples, a very famous document. And after this, the whole decade was termed as the decade of decolonization. And another significant uh, resolution was uh, that of 1970, resolution number 2625, declaration on principles of international law, friendly relations and cooperation among states. Among other principles, it mentions the right to self-determination. Not only this, but also another important resolution, 1974, resolution number 3314, consensus definition of aggression. Now, this is important because here the General Assembly was trying to come up with a consensus definition of aggression. And even there, in their consensus definition of aggression, they excluded the struggle for self-determination. This was the idea at that time. Uh, I'm also here referring to a few other uh, resolutions on a related issue that is the issue of terrorism because people sometimes uh, confuse the, the struggle for self-determination with that of terrorism. Interestingly, uh, this is uh, the, the title of this resolution 3034 of 1972. Uh, this title is very interesting. Uh, the title is very lengthy, but I will uh, like to read it. Uh, it is measures to prevent international terrorism, which endangers or takes innocent human lives or jeopardizes fundamental freedom and study of underlying causes of those forms of terrorism and acts of violence, which lie in misery, frustration, grievance and despair and which causes some people to sacrifice human lives, including their own, in an attempt to affect radical changes. Now this lengthy title tells you everything. They are trying to prevent international terrorism, but they also identify the reason why people uh, are led to sacrifice human lives, including their own. It is because of misery, because of frustration, because of grievance and despair, because of denial of fundamental freedom. Uh, uh, many other resolutions include, uh, which uh, had this title were passed in the following years. And the last time a resolution was passed with this lengthy title, it was on 4 December, 1989. In the meanwhile, there was also another interesting resolution passed by the UN General Assembly in 1984. And this is a resolution against state terrorism. Uh, but interestingly, even that resolution of 1984, resolution against state terrorism, it again reaffirms uh, the obligation to respect the right to self-determination. So on the one hand, there were developing countries which were recently decolonized, which got independence. They were stressing for the right to self-determination. And on the other, there were Western powers uh, uh, which had earlier colonized them. And now they were trying to dilute this right to self-determination by stressing upon stability and things like that. So this is the dilemma. And we see this dilemma even uh, when the additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions was adopted in 1977. Of course, uh, Article 1, Sub-Article 4 
of that additional protocol is very important for us. And I will quote it again uh, in full. This is Article 1, so Article 4 of the additional protocol 1. And I quote, the situations referred to in the preceding paragraph include armed conflicts in which peoples are fighting against colonial domination and alien occupation and against racist regimes and the exercise of their right of self-determination as enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations and the Declaration on Principles of International Law concerning friendly relations and cooperation among states in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations. So referring to the 1970 resolution, as well as to the UN Charter, this uh, article says that people who uh, fight against colonial domination, alien occupation, and racist regimes for uh, exercising their right to self-determination, uh, for those people, this additional protocol is applicable. This additional protocol, Article 1, sub-Article 4, thus acknowledges that this is an international armed conflict. However, it is well known among the academia as well as the, in the international community that even after this additional protocol has been adopted, scholars have been persistently, Western scholars, a large group of them, uh, has been persistently trying to undermine uh, the application of and the significance of this particular article. So they try to confine it, even uh, if you look at the commentary of the International Committee of the Red Cross, there are opinions about uh, confining the operation of this particular article to the colonial context. Interestingly and importantly, the Kashmir issue uh, was in my view, the first issue where the right to self-determination was specifically taken out of the context of colonial uh, domination. Uh, in the First World War and, and be, uh, between the two world wars, the talk about self-determination was specifically about colonies. Uh, mandate system, for example, was introduced by the League of Nations and then uh, self-determination or uh, uh, the right of self-determination for people of non-self-governing territories. This was debated at that time. But when the resolutions were passed by the UN Security Council on Kashmir issue, now this was perhaps the first time that uh, self-determination was taken out of that particular context, and now it was uh, generalized and globalized. Uh, the Palestinian issue, the Kashmir issue, and then later on, after the disintegration of uh, the former Yugoslavia in 1990s, uh, the issue was taken further. Now, an important issue in this regard for international humanitarian law perspective is that Article 2, common to the four Geneva Conventions, specifically says that if uh, there is occupation then there is international armed conflict. The four Geneva Conventions apply to that situation. If that occupation is complete, or if even if that is partial occupation, not only this, it further says that even if there is no resistance to this occupation, still the occupation per se, occupation in itself, is enough to constitute international armed conflict. We have to take up this point and to stress it that the state of Jammu and Kashmir was occupied. Uh, Dr. Ijaz Hussain, a very well-known scholar who has written a very uh, well-researched book on the Kashmir dispute, Kashmir dispute and international law perspective, published by the Paidi Azam chair, Paidi Azam University, Islamabad. He has explained in detail why uh, the accession was not legal under international law why uh, the Maharaja did not have the power to do this, uh, and even conceding if he had the power, what were the circumstances in which uh, he acceded to uh, the Indian Union, and why that could not be considered to be valid because of coercion, and because Indian troops had already landed there, and many other arguments. So he has given all the relevant 
details of the uh, legal principles involved here. So once we establish that there is occupation, partial or complete, even if there is no resistance, this is international armed conflict. And as you talked about prolonged occupation, this is indeed a case of prolonged occupation. And one of the problems with prolonged occupation is that people forget that it is an occupation. Although legally it is an occupation, it is illegal, sooner or later the, the occupying power has to leave it. And once you establish that this, this is an issue of occupation, then there are many instruments which uh, become very significant. For example, the fourth convention, or Geneva Convention that is talking about uh, uh, the duties of the occupying power, the obligations, and then the rights of the people in the occupied territory. And we have many other significant international documents. Uh, for example, the ICJ uh, advisory opinion on the construction, on the legality of the construction of a wall in occupied Palestinian territory, where the ICJ has enumerated all the legal consequences from the perspective of human rights law, humanitarian law, uh, criminal law, as well as from uh, the perspective of occupation law. So all these things th then become relevant. Uh, unfortunately, uh, people have considered the Kashmir dispute as a dispute between Pakistan and India only. And they have forgotten the fact that the state of Jammu and Kashmir was being occupied by India and then there was a struggle and then that issue remains unsettled till date. So you have to remind the world time and again that this was the origin and that that issue remains unsettled, that agenda remains incomplete. So you do, cannot have, uh, you do not have any escape from this question that this is an occupied territory and people in occupied territory have their rights and the occupying power has to leave it to vacate it sooner or later. And the sooner the better, of course. Once you establish this, I would also stress that we should not only highlight these atrocities, uh, we should not just call them human rights violations. Yes, human rights violations, they are, no doubt about this. They are human rights violations. This is indeed a very serious issue. We should highlight it on every forum but we should just not stick to this idea because they are not merely violations of human rights law, they are also war crimes. Because occupation is there, the state of war continues to exist. When state of war is there, then these atrocities are also war crimes. They, and then of course, crimes against humanity can be committed even in peacetime. But as I said, my position is that this is a case of occupation. Occupation uh, is, uh, uh, occupation denotes, it tells us that the state of war exists. So if the state of war exists, we should call them war crimes. And then we should also uh, try to raise this issue uh, using the jargon of international criminal law. Although we have problems because uh, neither Pakistan nor India uh, is a party to the Rome Statute of the International uh, Criminal Court, but still, uh, the people of Kashmir and all those who uh, are supportive of the Kashmir cause should, at least in academia, hi highlight this aspect that uh, this is an issue of not just human rights violations, rather these are crimes and that criminal law should also be applied to this situation. Uh, as far as the International Committee of the Red Cross is concerned and why it uh, is not doing the things which we expect it to do. Although we should acknowledge that the International Committee of the Red Cross has been doing a lot uh, in very severe uh, situations uh, in Kashmir for the last 70 years or so. Yet what we expect from it is the clear acknowledgement, recognition of the fact that this is an international armed conflict. And in my view, the reason for this is that uh, this aspect of occupation has not been stressed the way it should have been. If we stress this particular point that state of Jammu and Kashmir has been occupied and occupation means that state of war continues, so this is an international armed conflict, then perhaps uh, we would uh, have a very convincing case. I would like to uh, be enlightened by the great scholars and dignitaries who know much better than me 
and who have been working on this issue for decades. So with this, I will conclude my talk here. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, thank you. Uh, so again, uh, the, both of the countries have not uh, ratified the additional protocol. And a uh, uh, few uh, few days before, uh, I had honored uh, to be in the class of Marco Sassoli. Uh, so Professor Sassoli, uh, I mean, he just he has uh, emailed me a document in which the AP is uh, the draft. Which legitimise uh, the armed insurgency and armed uh, this uh, the liberation. I mean, uh, they have erased the draft, and uh, I don't know uh, how would be the situation of the indigenous armed rebels uh, who are fighting for the war of liberation in the occupied territory or uh, the, the war in a self-defence. Uh, and uh, about the ICRC, ICRC uh, pursuant to the Kashmir is uh, very. Is, uh, I mean. They have a duality, like uh, they're concerned about uh, the 10% uh, inflation on the Syria or Yemen, but uh, they, they're not concerned about the uh, vandalization, destruction of the property, the, I mean, uh, the humanitarian crisis which Kashmir meets. With this, uh, uh, we'll call a second the floor is yours, uh, uh, Ashraf Qazi Sahab. Your floor, the floor is open for you. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Nasir Qadri Sahib, as well as uh, the other extremely uh, distinguished uh, members of the panel. I must, at the outside, uh, say that I'm not an international lawyer or a lawyer of any kind, but I have been a career diplomat, and Kashmir, of course, has been top of the Pakistan foreign policy agenda, and therefore, uh, we have always tried to familiarize ourselves with uh, the basic legal aspects of the, of the dispute, but apart from the legal aspects, there are the diplomatic aspects, and then there the extra diplomatic aspects uh, that need to be considered when all, all else fails. Uh, in the United Nations uh, Security Council, the Kashmir issue is listed on the agenda as the India-Pakistan question. This is in accordance with the India Independence Act, which stated that the princely states of British India uh, would accede to either India or Pakistan in accordance with the wishes of the majority of their people, even when the rulers uh, who may be of a different faith uh, <clears throat> made uh, a decision uh, in Kashmir, it was made explicit there would need to be a reference to uh, the majority, uh, the opinion of the majority. Accordingly, the United Nations Security Council resolution of 39 of the 20th of 20th January 1948 called for a UN administered plebiscite to be held in Jammu and Kashmir for the people to decide whether they wish to join India or Pakistan. India accepted the resolution and Nehru said if the vote went against India, he would bitterly regret it, but would accept it. India immediately began complicating the work of the UN CIP, Commission for India and Pakistan, which was set up to organize the UN administered plebiscite. Meanwhile, India launched a genocide in Jammu to convert it from a 61% Muslim majority region to a Muslim minority region. This involved genocide in which reportedly more than 300,000 Muslims were killed. These figures may or may not be exact, but they, they show the magnitude. Um, and an even greater number expelled into Azad, Jammu and Kashmir and Pakistan. When Pakistan joined US-led security pacts to ensure itself against what it saw as Indian threats, Nehru used it as an excuse to withdraw Indian support from the UN resolutions on Jammu and Kashmir. India refused to demilitarize in Kashmir in accordance with the United Nations Security Council resolutions and UNCIP. Yes. 
there's an interruption. Can my voice be heard? Hello? So we can hear you. You can hear me, all right. Uh, <clears throat> so the UN Security Council resolutions on Jammu and Kashmir were taken under, uh, uh, under chapter six uh, of the UN Charter, which is concerned with the Pacific settlement of disputes rather than under chapter seven, which is concerned with action with respect to threats to the peace, breaches of the peace, and actions of aggression. It is commonly but mistakenly taught that UN resolutions under Chapter 7 are obligatory, while under Chapter 6 they are only advisory. This is wrong. Resolutions under either chapter have the same legal status and are obligatory. The only difference is that under Chapter 7, the resolutions are enforceable. According to some legal experts, the designation of UN resolutions as under Chapter 6 or 7 is actually a much later development than when the first resolutions of Kashmir were adopted. Moreover, under Article 99 of the UN Charter, the UN Secretary General, if he thinks the situation threatens the peace in a specific region, he can refer the matter to the United Nations Security Council for urgent consideration. There have been at least three Indo-Pakistan wars over Kashmir, and since August the 5th, 2019, India has escalated both its warlike rhetoric against Pakistan and violence across the line of control. The United Nations Secretary General has more, more than ever an obligation to take these developments into consideration and refer the matter to the UN Security Council under Article 99 for their immediate consideration with reference to all the previous UN resolutions on Jammu and Kashmir, which remain valid. In other words, de facto, if not de jure, the UN Security Council resolutions on Jammu and Kashmir can take on some of the character of Chapter 7 resolutions in case, um, in the event that UN Secretary General sees the urgency of the matter. According to UN Security Council Resolution 122 of 1957, the UN refuses to recognize the alleged accession of Jammu and Kashmir to India in violation of existing UN resolutions. In other words, India might seek to create facts in Indian occupied Kashmir, but it cannot create international law for Jammu and Kashmir, which is not Indian territory, and accordingly beyond the writ of the Indian constitution. So much for Article 370 of the Indian constitution. The introduction of black laws in occupied Kashmir the massive violation of human rights, including several massacres, the impunity allowed to Indian perpetrators of atrocities against Kashmiris, the torture of a double lockdown on Kashmiris, not for the protection of their health against COVID, but for their repression and elimination as a political community, attest to India's awareness that the vast majority of the population of the valley refuse to consider themselves Indian and the determination of India to eliminate them as an obstacle to the absorption of occupied Kashmir into India. The United Nations General Assembly in its resolution, and I think it was referred to by the previous speaker, 3314 in 1974, and then again 1982, recognized the right of oppressed people to wage struggle including armed struggle for their recognized but forcibly usurped rights to self-determination. The resolutions also recognize the right of such oppressed peoples to solicit assistance, including armed assistance from abroad to carry on their legitimate struggle against oppression and the forcible denial of their legitimate and recognized rights. While condemning aggression in all its forms, these resolutions specifically excluded armed struggle on behalf of recognized international rights 
including the right of self-determination, from such condemnation. More recently, especially since 9-11 and the so-called war on terror waged by the US and its allies, there have been attempts by international lawyers from these countries to deny the right of armed struggle under any circumstances, including the right of self-determination. However, the UN has never recognized Jammu and Kashmir as having acceded to India. Accordingly, denial of the UN acknowledged Kashmiri right of armed struggle on behalf of the right to self-determination cannot be rescinded in any circumstance. So where do we go from here? On August the 5th, 2019, Indian Prime Minister Modi decided to eliminate the already hollowed out special status of occupied Kashmir under the Indian constitution and to eliminate it as a political entity by making it a union territory. This has hugely compounded India's defiance of international law. India is relying on its supposed great power status, which in its view entitles it to make international law for others and not to be bound by it itself. Six days later, on August the 11th, 2019, Genocide Watch issued a genocide alert regarding the situation in occupied Kashmir with reference to the Genocide Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide in 1948. In Article 2 of the Genocide Convention, geno uh, genocide is defined as any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group as such. And they include killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. You will notice that on each one of these constituent elements of genocide, according to the Genocide Convention, India has taken action. In addition, genocide watches, um, um, genocide alert for Kashmir listed 10 stages of the genocidal process in occupied Kashmir as being far advanced. These include a number of categories. The first one is classification. Hindu and Sikh Indian army as us versus Kashmiri Muslim civilian, civilians as them. In other words, us versus them. Symbolization. Muslims have Muslim names on their ID cards, Kashmiri language, dress, mosques, etc. Three, discrimination. Hindu pundits were economically dominant until 1990, and later the BJP reasserted Hindu power. Dehumanization. Muslims are called terrorists, criminals, separatists, insurgents, etc. Organization. 600,000 and now many more heavily armed Indian military troops and police dominate Kashmir. Six, polarization. Modi and the BJP incite anti-Muslim hatred, social media, spread falsehoods. So, uh, uh, seven, preparation. The Indian army occupies Kashmir. The BJP leaders speak of the final solution for Kashmir. Eight, persecution. Kashmiri Muslims are locked down. This was before COVID. Uh, persecution. Uh, 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 subject to arrest, torture, rape, and murder. Extermination, that's the ninth uh, one. Genocidal massacres occurred during partition since 1990. There have been several massacres of Muslims. And finally, denial. Modi and the BJP say their goals are to bring prosperity and end terrorism. They deny any massacres. No Indian troops or police are ever tried for 
torture, rape, or murder, Modi's takeover in Kashmir is moreover very popular with the vast majority of the Hindu community, majority community in India. In view of the above, Genocide Watch called upon the UN and its members to warn India not to commit genocide in Kashmir. This is important because we hardly hear the word genocide in Pakistani statements. Yes, in the beginning, there was much mention of it. And then reportedly some of the UN senior officials said, please avoid the use of extreme language, which is provocative and seek to ameliorate the situation by avoiding such words. But under international law, genocide watch and in accordance with the Genocide Convention, what India has been doing is tantamount to progressive genocide. A year later, it is time for Genocide Watch to upgrade its genocide alert to, gen to a genocide warning, which if not heeded by India or the international community will lead to the final stage of the genocide process, which is known as a genocide emergency. Pakistan's response has so far been restricted to diplomacy and lawfare. They have achieved some successes, but more setbacks. They will need to be intensified and improved. However, the brute reality is that they will never be sufficient to elicit international pressure on India sufficiently to reverse its policy of progressive genocide in occupied Kashmir and threats against Azad Jammu and Kashmir and Pakistan. Pakistan's policy on Kashmir as a result suffers from a fatal ambiguity. Many Kashmiris on both sides of the line of control, while appreciating Pakistan's support, are increasingly aware Pakistan cannot make a decisive difference to their plight. This is playing into Indian hands. Recently, a six party group of Kashmiri parties met in Gupkar and indicated a willingness to settle for a reversal of the August 5th decision and a restoration of Kashmir's special status, including articles 370 and 35A of the Indian constitution. Many of these leaders in the aftermath of August the 5th, 2019, last year, said they had learned a lesson of their life and they had made the mistake of their lives in trusting India um, that it would abide by the special status. And now they were left not with three chances, of India, Pakistan, or Azadi, but only two, Azadi or Pakistan. The Indian option for them was out. There seems to be now a number of Mir Jafars and Mir Qasims amongst them, whether this is due to the ambiguity of Pakistan's policy, which has undermined their will vis-a-vis uh, -vis India's uh, uh, policy of August uh, uh, the 5th, 2019, or they themselves lack the stamina uh, to continue their resistance, or one can sort of uh, decide. If Modi caves in because of his failed economic and COVID policies, he may find himself politically isolated within India, or rather within the BJP RSS, but this will be no gain for, for Pakistan or the Kashmiris because Pakistan's policy is not based on the Indian constitution or any article of the Indian constitution, such as Article 370 or 35A, nor is that the position of the Kashmiri resistance as led by the <coughs> APHC, the All Pakistan, uh, All uh, <coughs> People's Hurriyat Conference, uh, and after August the 5th, a number of those who had thrown in their lot with India had joined them in saying that that option is out. And a certain reversal is taking place now of this policy, which should be of great concern to Pakistan. The Kashmiri resistance, whatever Pakistan's policy is, 
will continue. If Pakistan does not ensure its survival, a valid, which is a valid objective under international law as already mentioned, mentioned, in other words, Pakistan does need for its policy to remain credible to ensure that the Kashmiri resistance and Kashmiri armed struggle survives, which as I have mentioned is totally consistent with UN resolutions on the subject of armed struggle against the forcible denial and usurpation of a recognized right of self-determination and to call upon assistance, including armed assistance. If Pakistan moves away from that, then the struggle will remain, but it will be hugely compromised and it could well be overwhelmed by India's progressive policy of genocide because of sheer momentum of India's, of the size of India versus the uh, resistance in occupied Kashmir. If, if Pakistan chooses in such a circumstance to be a passive witness to this massive atrocity, having already lost its majority in 1971, there will be a real danger of the country losing all its meaning. The consequences, to put it very mildly, will be unmanageable. The only way forward for Pakistan, in my view, and I know a number of people do not agree with me here, but I will say it, and I, uh, that after all the diplomacy and lawfare, India cannot be made to reverse its policy because the international community is simply not ready to do so for a number of reasons to, due to real politics, economic factors, the size importance of India, and of course, the image of Pakistan, which is not as good as it should be because of many of its policies which have compromised its image. And all of these things play into the, into the kind of influence Pakistan's arguments on behalf of Kashmir wield, even though they are, in terms of law, totally correct. So Pakistan is confronted with what to do in this situation. Be a passive witness to the annihilation of the Kashmiri resistance, which would then play into the <coughs> uh, possibility of Pakistan itself facing existential problems, or finding some kind of out-of-the-box diplomacy. In my view, Pakistan should consider a two-track. It can be three or four tracks, depending on what detail you want to go. But broadly speaking, a two-track, simultaneous two-track policy towards Kashmir, one track should involve the search for a peaceful settlement, a principled compromise settlement of Kashmir, such as was attempted in the back channel of some years ago, which was controversial in Pakistan. Many of them, many people supported it as the only possible option. Others called it an outright betrayal of the Kashmiri cause. But then, of course, we need to recognize the reality that there can never be a zero-sum solution to the Kashmir problem such that Pakistan wins over India, Pakistan wins, India loses, or India wins, Pakistan loses. That is not possible because it will not be consistent with the maintenance of peace and stability in the region. And you have to consider in this regard the fact that the two countries do have a very significant deterrent capacity vis-a-vis -vis each other. So zero-sum solutions are not possible. Positive-sum solutions are the only way forward. The problem now is that Modi sees himself as so powerful vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan that he's not willing to even consider any kind of compromise. And therefore, it leaves Pakistan with no option but to follow a two-track policy in which, in the first track, we go out of our way to seek a dialogue with India, to seek a human rights, an improvement in the human rights situation in Kashmir, to seek a, a, a gradual, progressive, incremental, cumulative progress towards a principled compromise settlement, which is acceptable primarily to the people of Kashmir and, therefore, and also then the people of Pakistan and India, the likelihood of this track succeeding today 
is very low because of Modi, the RSS and the BJP policy. And it was also very, very low when Congress was in power. You will note that in India, there is some opposition to the violation of Kashmiri human rights, but there is very little recognition of Kashmiri political rights, even by champions of the human rights of Kashmiris. But what they ignore is that in Kashmir, the denial and violation of human rights is directly derived from the denial of their political rights. If you address the political rights, you will set the scene for a major improvement in their human rights. But if you refuse to compromise, that is, if India refuses to discuss and seek with Pakistan a peaceful, principled compromise solution with respect to the uh, political rights of the Kashmiri people, such as would be acceptable to them uh, in a realistic world, then there is no hope of an improvement in the human rights. And inevitably, there will be a progress towards genocide. In that case, the second track which would be simultaneous with the first track would come into option into play, which is that Pakistan would tell the world credibly and its image would improve that we are seeking, we are going out of our way. We will go the extra 10 miles, 20 miles for a peaceful settlement. But A, if we are re totally rebuffed and B, far more importantly, if India continues its progress towards the genocidal solution of Kashmir, then that will be as much of a threat to exist to Pakistan's existence as a war with India could be. And Pakistan will be left with no chance to do everything to stop India's progress towards a genocidal solution in Kashmir. Now, the argument here, up until now, Pakistan's argument of this nature would be dismissed out of hand. We have seen you lose the majority of your country uh, to India, and you did nothing in particular. You adjusted yourself to being half the country that Qaeda Azam founded. We will have to convey with our peace initiatives Pakistan's peaceful nature and the sincerity of it and improve our image. But at the same time, we will need to include the credibility of our warning that India completely ignores Pakistan's initiatives and proceeds towards a genocidal solution, then Pakistan will go out of its way to stop that, no matter what the cost may be. Now, this, ironically, is the only way to A, prevent genocide, and prevent uh, war between India and Pakistan, because if this warning is taken seriously by the international community, then the pressure on India would mount, would multiply, would increase to the point where India could be forced to take a second look at its policies then, you know, with respect to not only August the 5th of last year, but also with respect to a settlement, a final settlement of Kashmir, which would have to be a compromise settlement acceptable to all three parties, primarily the people of Kashmir. Now, should we be able to reach such a compromise settlement? It would be legally possible, but it has to be made politically possible also, if it were to be practical, that such a uh, compromise settlement would then be put in the shape of a new UN Security Council resolution embodying a settlement acceptable to the Kashmiri people and also to Pakistan and India, which would then be adopted unanimously. And then you could have, you know, the way open to a vastly improved India-Pakistan relationship, having championed uh, the rights of the Kashmiri people. There are no perfect solutions. There are no risk-free uh, solutions. There are no cost-free solutions. But if we pretend to be going for an absolute solution, uh, an absolute victory over India, then in reality, we will be going for nothing. And we will be, in a sense, seen by our Kashmiri brethren as totally misleading them. And many of them are already saying, Pakistan has already given up the struggle, and the rest is all verbal, um, you know, uh, uh, verbal fireworks coming up with 70 year old maps as new maps and as a sign of a new aggressive diplomacy. We should avoid such uh, gestures which lack credibility and undermine the faith of Kashmiris in the sincerity of Pakistan's policies. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Kavisar. Thank you. Uh, thank you.
certain things were uh, out of the topic, but they were really interesting and important um, with respect to the law of war. So without uh, taking much time, I would call uh, Dr. Fai uh, for his, I mean, the floor is yours, Dr. Fai. Sir. I must say, these opinions are mine. They don't represent the government of Pakistan. I'm retired. I have now achieved a more important position as a citizen of Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gazi sir. As a free citizen. <laughs> Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Motram Ambassador Ashraf Jahangir Kazi Sahab, Justice Ali Nawal Chuhan Sahab, Dr. Muhammad Mushtaq Sahab, dear brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the Legal Forum for Kashmir in particular Nasir Sahab for organizing this very important webinar on Kashmir. But before expounding on the subject, I would like to remind everybody that we are mindful that there have been hundreds of webinars on Kashmir within the past few months. But these webinars brought no change on the situation in Kashmir. So the very first question arises, why do we need to have one more webinar? What justifies holding another? Yes, it is true that these webinars did not produce the tangible results on the ground. But it is equally true that non-holding of these webinars will have the most damaging, most devastating, and most painful impact on the situation in Kashmir. If we fail to have a webinar, it is going to strengthen the impression created by Narendra Modi and his administration that Kashmir conflict has no life left in it. It is also going to strengthen the impression that the exertion of Indian military might have settled the matters in Kashmir. It is also going to strengthen the impression that the atrocities committed by Indian army has compelled the people of Kashmir to resign to the Indian occupation. Ladies and gentlemen, we know that this impression is absolutely false. That's why it is very important that we must erase that impression, thereby to have one more webinar. I have to give the description of the situation in Kashmir, but please allow me to say just a few words before that. Few words about the ground reality. There was a survey in Kashmir conducted by London based Chetam House, and it was released by BBC on May 27, 2010. The leadership of Pakistan, the civil society of Pakistan, for God's sake, don't listen to me. Don't listen to Sayyid Ali Girani, Muhammad Yasin, Malik, Nirwaz, Umar Farooq. Listen to Chetam House. When you want to chalk out your strategies, chalk out if you want to support the people of Kashmir, respond to this survey which was conducted by Chetam House, May 27, 2010. Long questionnaire. One question, ah, kya kya kya, it was in Urdu. What do you want? 90 to 95% of the people of the Valley of Kashmir, they want Azadi. When India came to know about this report, they got very frustrated. The immediate reaction from India, when people of Kashmir demand Azadi, they really do not know what they are talking about. Ladies and gentlemen, the catch phrase of the freedom struggle on the streets of Kashmir is Azadi. 
let there be no doubt. Azadi does not mean autonomy. Let me also be clear here with the fullest possible consciousness. Azadi does not mean Musharraf formula. Azadi does not mean backdoor diplomacy when people of Kashmir are not the part of it. I will quote Arun Dhirat, one of the most recognizable Indian human rights activists. She was asked on October 3rd, 2019, less than a year ago, what do the people of Kashmir want? The people of Pakistan, please listen carefully. I can understand there are a lot of compulsions and the pressures of Pakistan on Pakistan. Just say it. We tried what we failed. Say it clearly that autonomy is the only solution. Say it clearly that it's a Dr. Farooq Abdullah and not Sayyid Ali Gilani, who is the leader of the people of Kashmir. Arunti Rai, she, whatever she said, it was the true reflection of the aspirations of the wish and the will of the people of Kashmir. She was asked, what do the people of Kashmir want? She said, I quote, the people of Kashmir have been saying it for the last 70 years. The people of Kashmir have been saying it with their blood. The people of Kashmir want right to self-determination. Then she repeated, they want right to self-determination. Ladies and gentlemen, I can understand the people of Kashmir they have more than 100,000 of their lives, hard blood, not for backdoor diplomacy, not for autonomy. We don't need Pakistani support to get autonomy. That is exactly what Dr. Farooq Abdullah is demanding. The situation in Kashmir, very alarming, very terrifying. I will just give you five phenomena. Here again, we are making a mistake. Not only you, the people of Pakistan, even we, the Kashmiri Americans, the Kashmiri dinosaur. We say there have been Indian military crackdown for the last one year. Absolutely false. The Indian military crackdown has been there for the last 29 years. What happened on that unfortunate night of February 23rd, 1991? During Kulon Pushpura, more than 100 of our sisters, they were dishonored. That was cracked down, ladies and gentlemen. Now we have COVID-19 lockdown. It is not unique to Kashmir. It is all over the world. But dear brothers and sisters, Wallahi, Wallahi, on behalf of the people of Kashmir, I have no words to express my thanks to appreciation to the people of Pakistan. The way you have supported us, the way you have given everything for the cause of Kashmir. But COVID-19 in Pakistan is totally different than COVID-19 lockdown in Kashmir. Your COVID-19 lockdown is to save the lives. The COVID-19 lockdown in Kashmir is to push the people of Kashmir to the extinction. The phenomenon number two. The epidemic of dead eyes, New York Times said it is unique in Kashmir. When Indian army is using the pellet guns on the peaceful procession, the health department of Kashmir government, they reported there have been more than 6,200 pellet guns victims in Kashmir and more than 1,000 lost their eyes sight forever. But ladies and gentlemen, it is not what happened a year ago. It is not what happened 10 years ago. It happened this week, ladies and gentlemen. To be exact, on Sunday, there was a peaceful Muharram procession. Peaceful. The pellet gun was used. 200 to 200 innocent Kashmiris, <coughs> they fell victim to the pellet guns. 
Now you may be thinking, after all, do the people of Kashmir at least talk to each other what is going on there? Ladies and gentlemen, if you are a journalist, you can write anything you want to write, but you cannot write what Indian army is doing in Kashmir. If you do, you will be instantly picked up and thrown in the jails of India. Hundreds of examples, I will give you just one. Asif Sultan, his articles appear not only in Kashmir, not only in India, in the international press. What was his crime, if at all there was a crime? He committed the same crime which was committed by Yashwan Sinha. And who is Yashwan Sinha? He was the BJP foreign minister of Bajpayee. BJP foreign minister, what did he say? I quote, India, you are making one after another mistake in Kashmir. Yashwan Sinha. You are making one after another mistake in Kashmir. There is no question of losing Kashmir. We have lost Kashmir, unquote. This is exactly what Asif Sultan said. Asif Sultan said, India, you are making one after another mistake in Kashmir. If you keep doing that, you are not going to have one. You are going to have hundreds of Burhan Wani's in Kashmir. He was picked up and detained under UFA, Unlawful Activity Prevention Act. Anybody picked up under this law can be declared as a terrorist. By the way, this law violates four articles of Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 7, 9, 10, and 11. It also violates five articles of International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Article 6, 7, 19, 21, and 22. Ladies and gentlemen, just a word about internet. You have been hearing about G2 and G4. Ambassador Ashraf Jahangir Qazi Sahab, Justice Chauhan Sahab, Dr. Mushtaq Sahab, G2 and G4. It can be an academic discussion on the streets of Islamabad. But G2 and G4 is a matter of life and death in Kashmir. Just an example. There was a doctor in Stims, which is Sheri Kashmir Institute of Medical Sciences, which is in the capital city of Sinagar. He had a COVID-19 patient. It's a new disease. He could not treat it. He called his doctor friend in England. Can you send me updated information? And the doctor friend from England instantly he sent him the email. This poor guy in the Stims he tried in the morning, in the evening, days after that, he could not download that information. It's a life and death matter in Kashmir. And the last phenomenon of human rights, very important, because it poses the existential threat to the people of Kashmir. That is the domicile law. We had the state subject law in Kashmir, no foreigner can settle in Kashmir. No foreigner can buy the land in Kashmir. But when you have domicile law, every single person who resides in Kashmir, even if you were born there, you must have this certificate. If you want to settle there, you want to have a job there, or you want to buy the property there. Can you believe it? Who can get this certificate? According to Indian census of 2011, there are already more than 1.7 million Indian migrants working in Kashmir for the last 30 years. They can get it. The children of these migrants, even if this is the law, even if they have not been in Kashmir for a day, they can get it. Do you know who cannot get it? I cannot get it. The Kashmiri diaspora cannot get it if they have not lived in Kashmir for the last 15 years. You do not need to be Einstein to understand why this is happening. This is happening because India knows it now as India knew it in 1947. The people of Kashmir are not going to vote for India. 
That's why they are going to change the demography. By the way, you need to understand the domicile law, abrogation of Article 370, 35A, it violates three resolutions of the Security Council. Subhanallah. Ashraf Jahangir Kaji Sahab, we are weak indeed. But thank Almighty Allah, we have the international sanctity. Resolution number 91 of 1951. Resolution number 122, 126 of 1957. Just to Chauhan Sahab, what do they say? These are the resolution of the Security Council. They say there cannot be any unilateral action taken to change the dispute in nature of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, as my topic is, why international community is silent? Let us make a distinction between world powers and global public society or global public square. When Narendra Modi abrogated Article 370, 35A, he did not want to resolve the issue of Kashmir. He wanted to dissolve it. People of Pakistan, you know who came to our help? None other than Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations. Three days later, on August 8, 2019, he gave us a hope because he is the custodian of human rights. He said Kashmir issue has to be resolved under UN Charter and under applicable United Nations Security Council resolutions. Ladies and gentlemen, when India imposed ban on internet, Director Modi said we have to have the ban on internet because we have to stop terrorism. People of Kashmir forget about everything. International community is on your side. Yes, we are not getting the support we get, but international community has never told us that get the autonomy. This was David K., the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. He said, we must have the internet in Kashmir, not to stop the terrorism, but to stop the disinformation and protect the civil liberties and ensure the accountability of authorities. Then there was a lot of human cry that India is doing numerous violations in Kashmir. That murder of Gujarat Narendra Modi, he said, Kashmir is our integral part, you cannot intervene in our internal matters. Can you believe it? 650 members of European Parliament, five congressional hearings and briefings in Washington, D.C. Not only they condemn it, but they said that the people of Kashmir speak. Ladies and gentlemen, Justice Chauhan and Ambassador Taji are going to tell you, when an NGO like Amnesty International speaks in the United Nations, just one NGO, about a particular country, it almost shakes the foundation of that country. You know how fortunate we are as Kashmiris. There are six internationally recognizable NGOs. They made a joint statement, including the Amnesty International, including Geneva-based International Commission of Jurists, including Paris-based International Federation of Human Rights, including Manila-based South Asian Committee on Human Rights, that the people of Kashmir have all the right to express their opinion and let the political prisoners be released. Ladies and gentlemen, just this month, last month, on August 5th, 17 United Nations experts, 17 of them, not only they condemn the human rights, but see the language. They say, United Nations, India has failed on the promise they have given that they are going to improve human rights. They did not. Now it is your responsibility. You must intervene. Who is saying it? Not Mohammed Yasin Malik said, Ili Gilani, 17 United Nations experts. Kashmir was paradise. 
but you know who does, who said that paradise does not exist anymore? New York Times say that India has made Kashmir hell for the people of Kashmir. When Narendra Modi said we are the largest democracy, here comes the Huffington Post that Indian democracy in Kashmir is dead. When India said there is normalcy in Kashmir, here comes Narendra, here comes Aruti Roy that 900,000 Indian military has made Kashmir the largest army zone in the world. Yes, it is true that these voices are there. But the problem is they have yet to translate their understanding into tangible action. You tell me the United Nations High Commissioner on Human Rights. It's a very important post, but the person who is holding that post is much more important than UN High Commissioner on Human Rights. She has been the elected president of Chile for 10 years. She's recommended to send a fact-finding mission to India. India says no. And we were not surprised India said no. But the UN High Commissioner took the no of India as an answer. So you may be thinking that after all, India says we are the largest democracy. Then how come on earth India violates all these international norms? India violates all these international covenants? There are multiple reasons, I will give you a few. India knows that it is one of the largest economies in the world. India knows the whole world is consumed with the COVID-19 pandemic. So the world powers are not going to pay attention to the situation in Kashmir. And unfortunately, world powers have remained silent. But the world powers do not know that their silence, their inaction, their passivity has given the sense of total impunity to the Indian army in Kashmir. Otherwise, how can you justify Justice Johan, a person no less important than Donald Trump? Not once, not twice, five times offering his office of mediation to know, do you know why? His words to mediate between India and Pakistan to help resolve that hot, hot tinderbox of Kashmir. India said no, and Donald Trump took the no of India as an answer. There could be many reasons, and Ashur Jangir Kajisav has been ambassador to the United States, he knows that. But I will give you two reasons. Number one, America has signed the commercial contracts of $110 billion with India. America would like India to play a role of shield against China. So all those universal values, all those international norms, they become victim to the commercial interest. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, that's why it is your responsibility. It is my responsibility. It is our collective responsibility to knock the door of every single member of the United Nations. Tell them only two things. You are the one who gave the right to self-determination to the people of Kashmir. Tell them the text of the resolution of the Security Council, which I as a Kashmiri American, with the people of Kashmir invoke they were not drawn up in the masjid. They were not written by an imam or an ayatullah or a maulana. Tell them the text of the resolution number 47, which was adopted on April 21st of 1948. It was written under the instructions of President Harry Truman by Ambassador of America to United Nations, Ambassador Warren Austin. Tell them, ladies and gentlemen, Kashmir is the only region in the world, only region, which shares borders with three nuclear powers of the world. India and Pakistan, they are at the brink of nuclear confrontation. And the bone of contention and the source of friction and the underlying cause of this tension is nothing but the issue of Kashmir. So United Nations must intervene. The world powers must come out of the slumber to resolve the Kashmir issue, not only for the sake of Kashmir, 
but for the sake of South Asia. South Asia, which is 1.5 billion people. South Asia, which is one fifth of total human rights. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I know my leader, Sayyid Ali Gilani, said when it comes between Kashmir and Pakistani sovereignty, Pakistani sovereignty comes first. This is my leader, Sayyid Ali Gilani, saying it. But I am telling the leadership of Pakistan, Wallahi, we understand the compulsions and the pressures you are under. But don't pursue this option of autonomy. Please, if you cannot help us, let the people of Kashmir be left alone. They can handle it. And I will give you just one example. I know my time is over. Just one example. As I told you, there has been a crackdown. But you know what happened on August 13? August 13 of this year, there was a special perpetual curfew imposed by government of India in Kashmir for two days, 14 and 15. And they justified it. They said, we have, we have the reports that the people of Kashmir are going to celebrate 15 August as a black day. Ladies and gentlemen, India knows. They have been able to arrest and kill more than 100,000 people. They have been able to disappear more than 10,000 people. The torture and Ambassador Jahangir Kali mentioned very correctly. It's a routine there. But they have not been able to win over the hearts and minds of the people of Kashmir because they knew they are going to be on the streets of Srinagar on August 15. And here I would like everybody to understand there was a challenge. And challenge was given by Muhammad Yasin Malik. When that poor guy was out, now he is in the Tehar jail. You know what did he, what the challenge was? He said, Narendra Modi. You take army not out of India, but take army out of Srinagar. And let me go to Lal Chok, which is Lal Chok is just two minutes walk from his office, Mama Jason Malik. Take the army out of Srinagar. And if I cannot get more than a million people in the Lal Chok, I am not going to speak about the people of Kashmir anymore. That challenge was then, that challenge is today. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Saab. Uh, though again, uh, a bit deviation in our topic, uh, armed conflict <laughs> should have revolved around this. Let me add Iskojan uh, norm, uh, like uh, the preemptive norm of the international law. If an occupant state is, it seeks a transformation of a legal or, or, or the uh, political order of the state by supporting the proxy government. Proxy, as you know, that uh, what is in the Kashmir, that they're all proxies. 12%, 11% uh, they get in the democratic, uh, these so called democratic elections. Uh, if uh, by the change, transformation of this uh, legal or a political order uh, by, way, by supporting the proxy government or that pursuing the goal of the illegal annexation, whatever what they did on uh, 5th of August, now the change of the domicile, as Dr. Fai already said, so that amounts to the uh, attention of the third world. I mean, third state. The situation, the conflict of the Kashmir is akin to the Palestinian. If you look to the cases of the, the, this advisory opinion case or any other, the, the consequence of the, this uh, illegal occupation, you'll get the case of Akin, but the, the why not international attention? Why we cannot, why not advisory opinion? And, and the, the, the technicalities like, uh, uh, let Justice Chauhan, uh, I mean, discuss those. India is accused of torture. You know, JKCCS, uh, they have done a wonderful job, like uh, the torture force, then for disappearance, some unma this, uh, unmasked graves. India is accused of torture. They have not ratified or signed this convention against torture. Same the UN Convention on Info Disappearance. As uh, rightly Jan Kazi Saab said that uh, there was a genocide alert. Uh, at least uh, it was a close to that classification of the genocide. Again, the, India is not. The Rome Statute, both India and Pakistan had not uh, ratified. APs, again, 
the with these difficulties but uh, uh, if they have not uh, signed this convention against the torture uh, they are party to the universal declaration of human rights or the iccpr which prohibits the torture uh, can uh, sir we uh, can we take these war crime uh, issues or the crime against humanity to, to any other uh, tribunal other than this uh, invoking the exact jurisdiction of international criminal court uh, the floor is yours sir uh, justice ali nawaz chauhan sir <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Yes, Are yes, you yes. getting me, please? Yes, we can hear you, Justice Chauhan Sir. But I am not continue. on the video. Are you seeing uh, me in the video? video. Yes. We can see you. Yes. Are you seeing me in the video? Yeah, yeah. We can see you. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for arranging such a wonderful talk and uh, such wonderful speakers, very illustrious people. Uh, now what they have said about history about uh, how the uh, legal aspects were trampled how the united nations resolutions were overlooked how we see the helplessness of uh, the united nations and uh, all other bodies who only speak of human rights and uh, this rhetoric doesn't go beyond that and we see that uh, <clears throat> the uh, human rights violations uh, go on without any <clears throat> without any stop now you have asked me the question what would be the ramifications of a prolonged stay of the occupation occupying forces of india uh, i would like to answer this part of the question by saying that legally speaking uh, this has no impact and uh, we have seen in the case of uh, the independence movement of all nations including that of the subcontinent that a hundred years or so on of occup occupation by a colonial power made no difference and uh, when we stood for our independence we got it so uh, uh, like in uh, the law we have prescriptive rights there are no such thing as prescriptive rights in the international law because uh, this occupation is uh, a usurpation and there are doctrines to the effect that whatever changes they may be making whatever they may be doing will have no consequence but what are the practical consequences we see on one hand uh, people are suffering the human rights are being violated and uh, war crimes are being committed with impunity and we find no remedy uh, uh, at hand uh, unless we craft one uh, to stop the war crimes uh, actually uh, under article 99 uh, of the un the secretary general is uh, supposed to take a notice of that the uh, high commissioner in geneva is also supposed to take notice of that and we find that uh, uh, there is um, a, a complete uh, uh, silence uh, as far as that is concerned in any practical terms and uh, the uh, indian 900000 soldiers on poor kashmiris of a particular faith are being uh, subjected to uh, crimes which you could only only compare with holocaust as far as the jews are concerned or we can go down a little to rwanda or we can go down little to what happened uh, um, at the hands of the serbs in uh, in the yugoslavia case and so on but you see uh, the tribunals were created there and uh, uh, the genocide the torture mm -hmm. the destruction of uh, of properties and uh, religious places and ethnic cleaning were made accountable so wherever the big powers have an interest then uh, of course uh, they will uh, create uh, institutions uh, even in case of uh, the murder of harari and so on they would in case of cambodia and they started with nuremberg they started with uh, the tokyo crimes the cambodian tribunal they are innumerable uh, uh, but the magnitude the quantum 
of uh, uh, wrongs which are being committed by India is no less than some of the examples that I have quoted. Now, I'm not repeating all the history and all the United Nations resolutions, which have been already dealt with wonderfully by the speakers before me, the honorable speakers before me. But I have only to see that uh, uh, what would be the upshot, how we go about. Now, uh, I think there are uh, two aspects of the whole issue. One relates to human rights and violation of human rights with impunity. The other relates to the territorial dispute between the two states of India and Pakistan. Now, as far as uh, uh, the territorial dispute is concerned, well, the states are uh, already, uh, were already engaged in uh, both the conflicts and otherwise in legal forums. And that matter is still sort of sub judice. Uh, further, there, there are caveats coming from, uh, there are caveats coming from, Jasab, you have just muted. You uh, kindly unmute your mic. Kindly unmute. I think, uh, Jasab, you have just muted your microphone. Kindly unmute. Is it all right now? It's all right, yes. <clears throat> again, again, you have mute. Kindly unmute your mic. Yes. 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 Yes, please. Are you getting me? So, uh, uh, now as far as those territorial uh, things are concerned, the state should uh, take note of it and they should go ahead uh, with uh, whatever remedies are available, whether political or otherwise, because there is a commitment also that the matters are to be resolved uh, in a peaceful manner between the parties. You know, this happened subsequently because of the war, because of the declarations between us and India. Uh, then uh, the, the present uh, matter where we can develop and we can go forward uh, uh, and create, uh, uh, you see, uh, an impre uh, a perception against India and the violations it is committing with the immunity is the human right aspect. Now, this human right aspect is uh, something where, uh, to my mind, and of course, subject to further uh, investigation, uh, doesn't call for uh, only the states taking up the matter. It will be wonderful if Pakistan went against the human right violations uh, and uh, it has a locus standi. If uh, Gambia could go in case of uh, Myanmar people, why can't Pakistan go there? What is there uh, which is an impediment in the way of Pakistan taking up the human right issue before the ICJ? Uh, I would urge the government of Pakistan and urge our prime minister uh, who wants to resolve this issue, who wants to uh, go ahead with it and uh, is not uh, he is not in any cobweb uh, and he thinks straight. So I think um, if, if this reaches him, his ears, uh, then uh, I think he is going, he can work on it and take the matter there. And I think that is going to be something wonderful because obviously while uh, uh, the status of Pakistan would be discussed there, the dispute uh, between India and Pakistan would also be um, would also be discussed and uh, accepted. So uh, I would still urge that they should go. But if they are not going, then of course we can look for uh, other avenues. Also, in our capacity, as as Ghazi Sahib has said, as citizens of uh, Pakistan, as brothers of Kashmiris, or some people from Kashmir can join us, uh, and this can be a mixture of people taking this issue now where? First of all, we can take this issue to the National Institution of Human Rights. And I've been a chairman of one of such institutions. And I know its strength 
I know the strength and power of these institutions, which are independent and uh, are 160 uh, in the whole world, all the members of what they call as the gallery. So uh, if we make them aware and keep them aware all the time about the atrocities, well, we will have a great public world opinion in, in that case, and India will have to hide its face. And that will be one of the greatest pressures we can put on India uh, without getting into politics. The other thing is that we uh, urge, uh, there, are, there are matters we can take to the United Nations. One of it is uh, under Article 99, where the Pakistan government can also go and speak about the violations of human rights and uh, urging the Secretary General to take cognizance like a Suomoto cognizance. Why can't that be done? Then uh, we have the dysphoria uh, of Kashmiris in uh, the United States. Now, I know uh, that uh, the courts international This of your voice is so cutting there's some problem. the issue hello yeah, yes please continue yes the whole idea is to agitate the issue uh, to such an extent uh, that uh, india starts hearing india starts behaving now take the case of uh, the national institute uh, national uh, human rights institution of india uh, in uh, kashmir they have uh, abolished the office, removed it. So, uh, I mean, these type of factums uh, can be brought to the notice of the international community. And India already is on the back wicket and uh, is trying to take uh, uh, diplomatic support. And unfortunately, our Muslim countries are also uh, trying to, in, uh, in a passive way, uh, support uh, India by by not objecting to the annexation uh, of a territory which was absolutely uh, uh, disputed and uh, consisted of consists of uh, Muslims uh, and uh, the very fact that the division of India took place on uh, the basis of a principle that uh, people were, who are in majority uh, will uh, go to Pakistan, but this was all uh, stultified, destroyed through a conspiracy. And I must tell you that uh, a book has been written by one of our representatives in the United Nations, Mr. Zafrullah Khan, uh, who's, who's spoken of the agony of Pakistan and sp uh, gave us a glimpse of the background of conspiracies of Nehru and of uh, Mountbatten and how uh, the great powers were involved ultimately because of their closeness and because of their, uh, uh, you know, common grounds um, and never let that happen, never let that matter be argued and uh, so on and so forth. So still we have a great game and that great in the great game, uh, there is a common interest of the great uh, nations. And they don't bother uh, whether it is Palestine or it is uh, Kashmir uh, with respect to the righteous way. They, they don't, wouldn't do it. Otherwise, yes, we hear of human rights. We hear of uh, big things. We hear of uh, actions uh, against genocide. We hear of uh, conventions uh, of war crimes, genocide, uh, and civil and political rights and civil and economic rights of the people of 1966 and so on. But uh, practically when it comes to, uh, uh, in, when it comes to the involvement of uh, the uh, big powers own interest, then everything gets slumbered. They, they just don't uh, uh, let it go. No. But they always respect public opinion when it grows. Even in America, you see uh, the death of a black has, has caused so much of fervor. So uh, let's not also forget that uh, the human rights uh, were fought uh, for, for their rights. The black fought for a hundred years. 
Now, uh, I don't mean that uh, this should last also for many years, 70, over 70 years have already passed. But we must find out alternate ways to raise human right issues. And that is my point. And this, uh, we don't have to really negotiate with uh, uh, the uh, some of the um, uh, limitations which uh, the rules provide or uh, uh, like uh, uh, only the state can go or principles of law like res judicata and so on and so forth. We can go just state forward and go recurringly. So uh, I think we should work on these uh, aspects and uh, take uh, human rights uh, aspect much further so that we bring some relief to the, uh, to the suffering people of uh, Kashmir uh, who deserve uh, every sympathy, every support. We don't want uh, things uh, to go just for, are forgotten like in the case of the Jammu mass massacre. And uh, because even when Jammu massacre was taking place, uh, a strong voice raised at that time would have left an uh, impact and impression. Now they want to change the population and uh, that is itself is uh, under the ethnic cleaning and is a war crime. And in case of some of the African countries, uh, change in population was taken as a war crime and uh, uh, the, these people were dealt with. And we asked the Security Council to constitute uh, what we call as a, as a tribunal, war tribunal, uh, to see uh, what uh, India has done and investigate. Uh, of course, uh, in case of Afghanistan, uh, they will, the superpower will not allow that to happen. Uh, but in case of uh, uh, Kashmir, I think there may be some uh, ice may melt and we can go forward. But how we keep the pressure on, this is important. Uh, reiterating uh, all uh, the resolutions all makes no difference because those are already part of books and record. We have to find out new methods to come out of it and then go forward with the innovation and new ideas so that uh, uh, we, we put uh, India uh, to shame uh, internationally. And I've said that uh, to exploit the constituency of uh, national uh, human rights commissions, which, uh, and thus uh, the, uh, the, what we call as uh, uh, the chief of the human rights in Geneva, the chief commissioner. Uh, of human rights in Geneva, and that that's going to help, because uh, once you strike this, then you see who who will object to, who will raise objections uh, to uh, uh, the pursuit for uh, uh, stopping uh, violation of human rights in Kashmir. Nobody will. I mean, everybody, whether they would do it hypocritically or otherwise, would accept. But about the territorial aspects, that's a bit of a difficult aspect and we leave the state to do that but we can help the state uh, uh, in its uh, way forward and uh, in its propaganda uh, but please also uh, see that uh, for, for several years uh, the uh, the quest for uh, uh, these rights uh, restoration of the rights of the Kashmiris and their right to exercise platform. Hello? We can hear you. Hello? Uh, you, have, you have again mute your mic. Kindly unmute it. There's some wrong. Uh, they have kindly unmute your mic. Uh, yes. Yeah. Hello. Kindly un unmute your mic. Yes, please continue. Is it all yes, right? Please. Achha. Yes, yes. So uh, let's take the let's take the human rights violation part forward. Then.
uh, there's some uh, something wrong. Uh, I request the participant. Uh, we have very. Uh, we'll be asking a limited questions. Five questions. Kindly uh, note. Uh, write down your questions so that we'll ask to guess. Limited questions will be taken because we have. We are running short of time. Yes, please continue, Jai Sir. Uh, please yes. see that one ramification. Uh, I think uh, there's some problem. One ramification is. Yes, please. Is it all right? Yes. yes one yes, ramification please. is that. One ramification is that the uh, the Kashmiris have already lost complete faith in uh, have completely lost faith in india you know previously uh, there used to be two opinions one was b coming from abdullah side and so on now they have realized uh, the chicanery and the trick which has been played on the poor people of kashmir so india has lost those people in they don't trust india at all and india cannot be trusted so uh, this is a very big loss and uh, for whatsoever long they stay there, India, uh, they would always be looked as as uh, uh, as persons who are not friends, persons who cannot be believed, who are tricky. So uh, this is a very big ramification, and uh, uh, India's uh, thinking that uh, the prolonged stay will help them transform these people. No, it's absolutely difficult. The Kashmiris have got a clarity now. When uh, Mr. Gilani speaks of Pakistan, well, he has a clarity, and and he got this clarity at this. Uh, he got this clarity at uh, at this age. Hello. Hello. Are you getting me? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Acha. So uh, please appreciate. That that is a very big loss. Second loss is that the the uprising in other various parts of India, asking for self determination, will also get strength because they will know that Indian government and the government in Delhi is not to be trusted, and their culture and other things are to be will will be always vulnerable at the hand of uh, the junta in India. So the Kashmir saga has has prolonged uh, ramifications. Imagine the youngsters uh, seeing uh, what is happening to their uh, relatives, seeing what is happening to their relatives, and so on. Have are standing against India, and uh, not even caring for their lives. Now that's a desperation, and India has brought these people to that level of desperation. Now, isn't that a very big loss to India? What will, what will India do with uh, so many people totally against India, not believing it, not trusting India, and uh, up against India in a conflict? So, uh, and let me tell you, sir, that uh, the Kashmir conflict is both an international conflict, and even if it is an internal conflict, when we take up the TEDx case, decided in, in international law in 1995, even an internal uh, conflict uh, is a conflict and uh, war crimes are then committed. And then uh, when we talk of human rights and we have built up an opinion, then I would suggest that we go for, uh, uh, for action uh, uh, as of, against war criminals, uh, which, which, which constitute from uh, uh, higher echelon to lower echelon. Let the world know that uh, we are alive to this. There is international law. If we don't get the remedy, that is not our fault. It is it is uh, the game. But uh, we have to take this again to forums for uh, action against uh, those who are involved in this massacre of people, in this uh, destruction of uh, their uh, polity and in uh, in creating such hurdles for them, which which are which are shocking for uh, the human conscience. So, uh, war crime is something we should not be setting aside or be out of our sight. We must threaten that we are going to try them. 
we can uh, the uh, american diaspora can try for war, war crimes in the united states uh, the other people living in europe and also they can also file that we can also hold courts which we they, let them call them as mock courts to try and then bring to notice of the world what each leader in india uh, has done uh, to destroy a culture destroy a civilization destroy a polity i, I mean bringing in hindi language there uh, and uh, taking away um, the kashmiri language what else they are destroying that and now is the time when uh, uh, india is uh, in, uh, having problems with its borders with its neighbors uh, i mean and atrocities are taking place within india uh, within uh, kashmir uh, i think uh, uh, this is the right time that we proceed uh, uh, with uh, with our actions at our level which is now the legal level thank you very much uh, thank you very much sir chohan sir uh, it was a really a, a great i mean a legal remedy uh, now uh, we'll be asking uh, if uh, anyone has a question because i have some three four questions uh, coming from the occupied valley uh, i cannot disclose the name uh, there are three questions pertain to professor dr mohammad mushtaq if anyone here has a question kindly uh, kindly raise either raise your hands or just text if uh, yes mr riyaz khalid please just uh, quick quickly bismillah assalamualaikum uh, warahmatullah good to see you all and thank you lfu okay for this uh, important webinar on international armed conflict and kashmir uh, my it is kind of a response to ambassador kazi you know ambassador kazi's tv shows have won him many uh, fans in occupied kashmir but today i was surprised to listen to him when he said a compromised acceptable solution it is so cheap and naive to listen to such aberration is coming from pakistan and what better than dr gulan nabi faiz uh, earlier any uh, remarks he made either you say we have failed and sit back kashmiris whether they are able to or not let them decide i will just revert to 1974 cyprus peace operation it's an example you know i am not making any comparison but it speaks of the vision that turkey had that year ambassador kazi uh, is a veteran diplomat knows it very well but i just it, for me as a kashmiri it's a lesson uh, uh, brother uh, nas just let me in next 6 60 seconds i'll finish it uh, the news and the tensions which we see these days in east mediterranean sea is the right steps which turkey took in 1974 and thanks to pakistan they were at their back pakistan helped them even militarily then as well and right now what we see is that pakistan feels apologetic when it asks its brotherly nation muslim countries to support them what they did is in 1974 is that they militarily intervened and uh, secured safeguarded saved turkish cypriots from greek greek annexation and august 5 was the greek movement greek uh, that 1917 movement for pakistan and it uh, it lost it now ambassador kazi after spending over four dec uh, decades as a diplomat of pakistan is telling us and i don't know what makes him say so that as a citizen of pakistan now i am more free and i am more you know powerful to make such statements and not as uh, someone who is in government so there is this duplicity i am not it is not any personal thing but it tells me you know what where do i have my put my expectations to thank so you thank you mr riyaz uh, we, we we have a very like to answer time. that question please i would need to answer that question uh, uh, allow me to answer that question my young friend here i agree with him and his passion but we have to look at what is possible and if in the pursuit of the impossible we impose impossible costs on our kashmiri brethren then we will be guilty of of truly enabling their situation to become even worse what i have said 
is that there cannot be a zero sum solution uh, to the Kashmir situation, which is justice requires a settlement in accordance with law. That is so far not available because of two factors, India's refusal and the criminal indifference of the international community. Therefore, what we need to see what is possible and primarily, we have to do this in consultation with our Kashmiri brothers. What is possible less than a 100% solution? A 100% solution means total victory for one side and total defeat for the other side. That is given the size of India, given the indifference of the international community, given many of the other challenges like climate change, pandemics, uh, the possibility of nuclear conflict, all of these things, that may not be the most realistic way to go. Is it possible to have something which is less than 100% victory, but enough to get a unanimous? Now, even that will require struggle. It will require diplomacy. It will require lawfare. It will require, and, even, and let me tell you, amongst uh, the diplomacy, the Pakistan Constitution, if you study Article 257 of the Pakistan Constitution, it actually legitimizes within the Pakistan Constitution the third option, the Azadi option. What does it say? It says that if there is a UN plebiscite in which the Kashmiri people choose Pakistan over India, then the relationship between Pakistan and Kashmir will not be in accordance with discussions between Pakistan and Kashmir. They will be totally in accordance with the wishes of the Kashmiri people, which do not have to follow the present constitution of Pakistan. They may choose a relationship of far greater autonomy than the provincial center relationship which exists today in Pakistan. In other words, under the Pakistan option, there would be the essence and reality of the Azadi option. The Pakistan option and the Azadi option do not have to be seen as mutually in conflict. They are mutually reinforcing. But Pakistan has to convince our Kashmiri brothers. It has to be able to follow a consistent policy. And it also vis-a-vis -vis India, we have to also get international support and by coming across as a country that wants peace, but if India instead says no peace, except 100% our terms, otherwise we proceed to a solution based on genocide, then Pakistan does need on behalf of its Kashmiri brethren to say, we will never allow that. Because if India imposes a genocidal solution, then that threatens also the existence of Pakistan. And therefore Pakistan will react similarly. Now, these are extreme um, uh, uh, possibilities. I am looking for something which our Kashmiri brethren can live with. Naturally, they're entitled and it is, uh, they have the right to say, we want Azadi, 100% Azadi and let the Indians lose. But in the will the world support that? Will the struggle be able to conquer the might of India? Is Pakistan conveying to them that we are in support with you for a war against India? We are talking through several mouths. We are sometimes saying we can go to any extent. Sometimes you are saying we will give you diplomatic support. Sometimes we are saying a number of other things. We are not consistent as a result of which our Kashmiri brethren are not clear as to what Pakistan's policy is. I am saying that yes, in the real world, none of us get 100%. Yes, you're entitled to ask for it, need it. And indeed, Kashmiris have been victimized. Their rights have been stolen from them. But it is possible that in the real world, sometimes compromise. After all, you know, uh, uh, we, uh, we know that even in the Prophet's time with the Meccans, there was a treaty of compromise. So compromise is not a sin if it is if it if it has some good advantages. If the people of Kashmir can live with it and accept it, yes, we can accept this, but not what India is demanding, which is complete suppression. You become Indians and you become along with the rest of the Muslims in India good 
third class citizens of India. No Kashmiri will accept that. No Pakistan can ever demand that of Kashmiris without becoming a, a traitor themselves and all to Pakistan and its ideals. But looking for a compromise which is acceptable to the Kashmiri people uh, and which also can become the basis of a compromise even with India and can be put, that is being realistic. That Otherwise we can ask for the moon. We can ask for the moon, will we get it? In 70 years, that policy of no compromise, 100% solution, what has it gone? Has it benefited India or has it benefited Kashmir and Pakistan? We have to consider difficult options also. So there is, I have not been inconsistent, you know? So please don't accuse me of being hypocritical or whatever words the young man used and all. I don't care for those words and all. I know what I'm saying because I say it from a good conscience. I have no personal interest except as a Pakistani an interest in the rights and the well-being of the people of Kashmir. That is our primary obligation. And as I said, 257 of our article of our constitution embodies the essence of the third option. And if, uh, if uh, and my, my personal view is, if ultimately the Kashmiri say, no, we only want a third option, Pakistan would be forced to consider that, of course. Naturally, we don't know what the reaction in Azad Kashmir would be, what would be the strategic implications of a third option, which is not included in the UN resolutions, and how would it benefit um, um, our Kashmiri brothers and all? Or why should they treat Pakistan and India in the same category, in the same basket, when we have failed as a supporter, but India has succeeded as a murderer of the Kashmiris. So, do you want to keep an equality between India and Pakistan? Is that uh, uh, Saab, it is being dragged too much? I no, don't know I, how, I, in how in which way you took my question. It is not about. Yeah, I took it co correctly. Not you, at you, all. Not at all. Your, res your response was not to what I said. I responded to you as the. Will be, to, to the, will, be, will be, I mean, stuck to the academic discussion. I have certain questions. Uh, this was an academic uh, topic. Uh, maybe it will be. It's not an academic, it's a, it's a life or death question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ashraf uh, Kazi Saab. I have a question for uh, Professor Dr. Mohammed Mushtaq from Occupied uh, Kashmir the students. Uh, the first question uh, is uh, what is the uh, legal remedy available uh, uh, for the Kashmiris to approach UN? Uh, where they can build the narrative, uh, a, a distinction between a terrorism and uh, the uh, uh, this liberation movement. Uh, the, this was this is the first question. And second question from the Kashmir: uh, When uh, India and Pakistan both are not a party to additional protocol, which gives, uh, uh, I mean, which legitimizes the uh, war of liberation uh, on the, this uh, self-determination, uh, what is the what would be the situation at this? And the third is again uh, the humanitarian thing. Uh, the uh, ICRC, New Delhi, the, uh, they have squeezed their, uh, they don't go to the uh, occupied valley. If you see that uh, how this uh, descent is being criminalized, like uh, you, a lawyer, uh, a, a renowned attorney, Mia Abdul Qayyum Saab, he was, uh, he was detained uh, for, the, for the wrong that he took, the, he challenged the, the Article 370, the petition which was uh, filed by the RSS uh, civil society. He, he, he contested that before the Supreme Court of India and he was the re renowned uh, attorney and he was detained for this wrong. Keeping in view the situation, the ICRC is back. If this conflict is uh, of the international armed conflict, even if India, in, even India does not categorize this conflict as a non-international armed conflict uh, because of the reason that it sees that it is a civil, civil war or a civil, uh, civil strife not an international or non-international armed conflict. Despite uh, that, there are some HRW reports of 90s. We say that it has attained the threshold of the both, that international as well as the non-international armed conflict. Uh, keeping in view, uh, kindly answer these questions of the academic nature. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Nasir, for these very pertinent questions. Uh, I will take this. Uh, uh, second question first, the one about uh, additional protocols and that Pakistan and India both are not parties to the protocol. So how we can build an argument on the basis of the provisions of this protocol when Pakistan and India, neither Pakistan nor India is a party to this protocol. The point is that uh, 
it is uh, uh, necessary uh, that one has to be a party to uh, a treaty uh, and only then the treaty becomes applicable on that state. However, uh, it is also a fact that uh, sometimes there are parallel uh, rules of customary nature which are found in state practice uh, and they are also found in treaty. So you have went in the same rule in customary law as well as in treaty law. And in that uh, case, of course, customary law binds all states. Uh, so this particular aspect that armed liberation struggle is an international armed conflict. This, this has become part of customary international law. This has been generally accepted by scholars across the globe. We have to build on that particular premise now that this is not just uh, because of the provisions of Article 1 or Article 4 of the first protocol that we say that uh, armed liberation struggle uh, is an international armed conflict. Rather, this is also part of customary law and as part of customary law, it is applicable on all states. This is one. Uh, I will come to the issue of remedy. Uh, Justice Johansa also talked about alternate uh, ways. Uh, I was, for that very reason, referring to uh, change in vocabulary and jargon. Instead of just talking about human rights violations, we should make case for considering these atrocities as war crimes. And one of the arguments which I tried to build up here was that uh, we should say that the state of Jammu and Kashmir has been occupied and occupation because it is illegal, it constitutes state of war, that continuous state of war remains there even today. And uh, that is why these atrocities will be considered war crimes. Now, I should add one more thing here, that prior to uh, the adoption of uh, the Pact of Paris in 1928, one could talk about occupation as one of the means for acquiring title to a territory. However, since that particular treaty has been adopted in 1928, the Pact of Paris or the Calic Bryan Pact as it uh, is also called, since then, international law has considered occupation and annexation illegal. Now, our case should be built up this way, that the state of Jammu and Kashmir was occupied, part of it was liberated later on, the rest remains occupied, and because it is occupied, it is in a state of war, hence it is an international armed conflict, hence uh, the atrocities committed there are not just violations of human rights law, they are also war crimes. Now, one more thing here, that uh, Pakistan, India, none of them is party to the Rome Statute. Still, there are ways. For example, under the Rome Statute, you have three uh, ways to bring a case to the ICC. One, a state party refers a case to the ICC. Of course, this option is not available. Second, the UN Security Council acting under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter refers the case to the ICC. That option is also not available. But there is a third option that the prosecutor of the ICC, based on reports available to, uh, with his office, uh, can bring the issue before the ICC and the pre-trial chamber will look into it. And if there is enough uh, uh, grounds for moving ahead, uh, the ICC can take up the case. So why not try that way? Why not bring all these cases, all these evidences and uh, reports about atrocities of various kinds committed by Indian troops there uh, and bring them uh, in the form of petitions, uh, of, of course supported by evidence to the office of the prosecutor, make a movement for this purpose uh, supported by various actors and uh, bring it to the limelight and compel the prosecutor's office to make a case. Now, it is true that uh, a case in the ICC takes a long time and it takes too much of costs as well. One has to consider many options. Ambassador Qazi was very much right, I suppose, to uh, talk about the just solution and the possible solution. One has to uh, consider these options while making a strategy. Uh, however, 
uh, this should be one of the options which should be considered by the policy makers, not only in Pakistan, but also by the uh, Kashmir diaspora across the globe. Uh, as far as the ICRC's uh, action is concerned, uh, ICRC, the, is, its working modality is a bit different. It works with the consent of the parties to the conflict. It seeks access, of course, it cites many provisions of the Geneva Conventions, which make it obligatory on the state parties to allow access to the ICC, uh, ICRC. But finally, it depends on the will of and consent of the particular party. So if the state refuses to give access to the ICRC, then the ICRC uh, has many ways to build a pressure, but uh, generally it uh, becomes a kind of paralyzed. Uh, one more thing, uh, perhaps you know this, that uh, the head office of the ICRC for South Asian region is found uh, in New Delhi. The whole region uh, is then looked after by the New Delhi office of the ICRC, except uh, Pakistan. Pakistan has a separate set of for, uh, for the ICRC. The rest of the South Asian region is looked after by the New Delhi office of the uh, ICRC. So of course, then the people there, they have their influence as well. Even if the ICRC officially does not acknowledge this, the, uh, we have been working uh, with the ICRC for many years. I have been uh, one of their consultants in Pakistan for more than 10 years now. Uh, I know that they would never acknowledge this, but of course, this is one of the facts that if you are there and then uh, the government's pressure and other things, they uh, do have an, an impact. So that can be one of the reasons. But again, I should come back to my first point that we have to present our case in a bit different way. Instead of talking about whether or not the conflict has reached the threshold of international armed conflict, we should make up a case that this has been an international armed conflict since its beginning. It has been an international armed conflict throughout. It is an armed co conflict even today. Let us make our case this way. Let us convince the ICRC as well that it has a mandate and it has an obligation uh, uh, which it must fulfill under the Geneva Conventions and, and under uh, its own statute because this is an international armed conflict from the very beginning and it, it continues to be so. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Again, uh, uh, a question has been asked. Uh, uh, in continuity, uh, Doctor, as you said that uh, one of the uh, the Kashmir, both of the Kashmir, one of the part was liberated and other another is still occupied. So the question has come that uh, oh, what if a state assembly can a state assembly uh, or of Azad Jammu Kashmir, uh, I mean, come up with a resolution that we are within our rights uh, to liberate our uh, the occupied territory by resorting to the armed struggle? Uh, what is Okay, that's a good question. In my personal view, I believe that this should have been done long ago and uh, it's never too late. In my view, we should consider, and this was the idea from the very beginning, and I would again refer to the uh, very uh, well-researched work of uh, Dr. Ijaz Hussain, Kashmir Dispute and International Law Perspective. The idea was throughout, from the very beginning, that the Azad Jammu and Kashmir government should uh, be at the forefront and it should be a kind of base camp uh, for the liberation struggle. Uh, unfortunately, for various reasons, political and other reasons, uh, this could not be done. But it is never too late. We have to reconsider, the policy makers have to reconsider their position. The Azad Jammu and Kashmir government should be uh, brought to the front. Pakistan should support it. In much the same way as, for example, France was occupied during World War II, a government in exile was formed, not even a base camp was there. A government in exile was formed and it was supported by the Allied forces during World War II. Uh, and special provisions then were also included in the, fourth, uh, in the third Geneva Conventions about uh, definition of combatants and prisoner of war, Article uh, 6, I think, in the, uh, or Article 4 in the 
third Geneva Convention here, four, five, six, uh, in the third convention, where even those people were given the status of combatants and when captured the status of prisoners of war, those people uh, who were fighting uh, from uh, on behalf of a party which was not recognized by the other party to the conflict. And this was in the context particularly referring to those uh, French uh, freedom fighters which were supported by the allied forces. So why not use those provisions? Why not uh, give this particular status to the uh, Azad Jammu and Kashmir uh, government that it should be, it should come to the forefront, it should uh, take the leading role, it should present the Kashmir's uh, case to the world and Pakistan should support it. As far as a reference to Article 257 is concerned, uh, the reference was given by uh, uh, respected Ambassador Qazi Sahib. With all due respect, I would say that Article 257 of the uh, Pakistan's constitution does not uh, allow room for the third option. Uh, and let me read the provisions of this Article uh, 257. The text I quote here, it says, and I quote, when the people of the state of Jammu and Kashmir decide to accede to Pakistan, the relationship between Pakistan and the state shall be determined in accordance with the wishes of the people of that state. What it simply says is that the, after accession to Pakistan, after the people of the state of Jammu and Kashmir accede to Pakistan, what kind of relationship will be there? What powers will be with the center, with the federal, federal government? What powers will be there with the newly uh, exceeded uh, province, say, uh, in the form of the state of Jammu and Kashmir? That would be through mutual understanding and in accordance with the wishes of the people of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. This is about post accession situation. If and when the people of the state of Jammu and Kashmir accede to Pakistan, then the future setup, the constitutional setup, would be decided in accordance with their wishes. How much of autonomy, what powers should be given to them, what powers should be retained by the Federation, all this should be determined uh, in accordance with the wishes of the people. But all this after accession. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nasir, Professor Nasir, Nasir, Thank you, Professor Nasir. Nasir Saab, I just want to take a minute. Uh, yes, please. A quick minute, then we will conclude this. Yes. A quick. So I think uh, it is very important to tell the audience over here, the people of Kashmir, they know that you cannot negotiate unless you are willing to compromise. And let me tell everybody here that I have published two articles. To be exact, it was 2002 in Boston Globe and 2000 in Washington Times. And I have mentioned here that if the peace in Kashmir is achievable, if all parties to the dispute, India, Pakistan, and Kashmir, they modify their stand, they make the sacrifices. And I have also said it is impossible to reach a solution of Kashmir dispute that respects all the sensitivities of India, that values all the sentiments of Pakistan, yet keep the whole state of Jammu and Kashmir intact. And let me conclude that the practical solution of Kashmir is, as I told you, I have written it. It's not that I'm responding to someone here. I have written it. That such a solution is possible, which is short of total integration into India and something short of total accession to Pakistan and something short of total independence of the state of Jammu and Kashmir that existed on August 13, 1947. But Nasir Sahib, we have to understand one thing. When Ashraf Jahangir Qazi Sahib or anyone else said that win-win situation, when you are giving the people of Kashmir autonomy, you are giving Pakistan Azad Kashmir. You are giving India, Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir. What are you giving to people of Kashmir? Nothing. So that's why when you are saying win-win situation, you have to really understand win-win situation is only for India and Pakistan, not for the people of Kashmir. Give them something other than autonomy and whatever that is, that is going to be decided. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I request uh, uh, Afzal Khushal to conclude this session for very brief. I mean, in a, in, in a quick. 
Uh, thank you to all the distinguished and renowned speakers that took part in the first of the multi multiple part series of webinars titled International Armed Conflict in Kashmir uh, that the Legal Forum for Oppressed Voice of Kashmir is conducting. This is going to be a part of, like I said before, many webinars that we will be conducting, which would eventually culminate in a published uh, blue book on international armed conflict in the context of Kashmir. Uh, I would just like to say that it was an incredible start to this initiative because of the, I would call it harmonious diversity displayed here today. Um, Dr. Mushtaq, uh, Dr. Muhammad Mushtaq Ahmed, uh, thank you for all your contributions as a legal expert and pedagogue of academic excellence for self-determination right of Kashmiris and uh, for uh, being a supervisor for many PhDs in academic knowledge build up uh, on the topic of Kashmir. Uh, Kashmiris are grateful to you. Uh, it was quite interesting the way you highlighted the self-determination aspect, which is an alienable uh, right of Kashmiris. Um, uh, you talked about Article 1, uh, sub, uh, sub uh, 4, additional protocols that they acknowledge the self-determination is a struggle, uh, uh, which, is, which is the colonial context legal. Uh, you mentioned uh, that. Uh, you, you also mentioned that uh the how the how um the self determination sentiments of kashmiris have been taken out of context uh, uh in the un security council resolutions um article 2 common to the four geneva conventions even specify that partial occupation uh, meets the threshold of an international armed conflict even if there is no resistance involved uh problems of prolonged occupation you mentioned uh are, are have this have this intrinsic uh, problem of uh, making people forget that it's a, that is a, it is still a continuing occupation. You also mentioned that um, the Fourth Geneva Con Convention talks about the occupational uh, entities and rights and how India has been violating all of them uh, in contravention to those uh, conventions um, and how the international community. Uh, very uh, recklessly thinks of it as a dispute between Pakistan and India, when a reminder should be put out to the world that uh, it is an ongoing uh, occupation from start to finish. Uh, you highlighted how human rights uh, uh, violations are misconstrued as, um, but, but should be purported as, um, and renamed as war crimes because of the intrinsic uh, international armed conflict ambit of, of the, the situation. You mentioned, uh, rightfully so, that although the Rome Statute is, uh, the pa Pakistan and India have not ratified the Rome Statute, the non-ratification should not be a barrier for Pakistan uh, to build up a case of academic knowledge and uh, to build up a case of war crimes or crimes against humanity uh, pertaining to the Kashmir conflict. In the follow-up questions that uh, Director Nasir uh, Qadri has asked you, you mentioned uh, how there is an, there is an avenue uh, for, a prosecutor, for the prosecutor's office to initiate proceedings and bring the, the Kashmir conflict under its ambit uh, with the duly authorization of uh, the pretrial chamber. Uh, and that's a very valid uh, argument, which I feel uh, Pakistan should use, uh, really uh, consider utilizing. Um, you mentioned the ICRC and how um, this should be stated from, from start to finish that it's an armed conflict and, and a, a case should be built. And you uh, mentioned this Pakistan side of things and how you clarified the Article 257 of Pakistan Constitution, how uh, the future of Kashmir is decided after the accession and how the relationship of the federal government will, will, um, will establish that relationship, which shows the... Uh, I think uh, a, a much more peaceful uh, uh, angle of, of the Pakistan side of things. Um, uh, Mr. Ashraf Jangir Kazi, um, I don't know if he's uh, in, this, uh, in this panel right now, but I would like to say thank you to him for his international diplomacy for and playing the, a, a very crucial part in promotion of the rights of Kashmiris throughout the world. Uh, I feel that his... Uh, articulation and the way he was uh, talking with very much with, with a lot of passion uh, shows that he is with Kashmiris 
uh, uh, and he is uh, playing a crucial role in t today's uh, dynamics of uh, international politics. Um, I was very pleased that he uh, clarified a few things that the, that the Kashmir contract is under the banner, still under the agenda of the UN Security Council, uh, and how he also highlighted a very misconstrued aspect that chapter six resolutions uh, are sometimes uh, uh, said to be to hold lesser importance to uh, chapter seven resolutions when the, the the problem is only on the difference of enforceability whereas chapter seven resolutions are enforceable while chapter six are, are advisory but also very valid and are uh, and can be operational uh, uh, and indicative of the conflict um, uh, Dr. Uh, Kazi also uh, reiterated the resolution 334 uh, uh, that self determination right in armed struggle is justified and is in, has possesses an ergonomous uh, character, which means that the international community must facilitate that right in all its uh, manifestations. Uh, he mentioned a very um, uh, an, a nice aspect of how uh, post 9 11 the the effectiveness of this right has been diluted uh, due to perhaps Islamophobia or hysteria created by the Bush, Bush administration after 9-11. Article 2 of the Genocide Convention, he mentioned how the Genocide uh, uh, Watch uh, published um, 10 triggers of genocides and how he articulated a very uh, important aspect of the genocide angle of, of things in Kashmir, um, classifying uh, how the, the BGP government usually classifies Muslims in the Indian occupied Kashmir as uh, who have self-determination sentiments as terrorists, which, are, which, are, which indicates specific uh, element which is required to prove genocide, uh, genocidal, uh, which is the genocidal intent, which is very specific and it uh, is distinguishable from crimes against humanity. Uh, he also mentioned how the Gupkar declaration uh, was working for the reversal of the the revocation of autonomy, and he also mentioned that it is not a tangible solution, as uh, uh, as India has not gained any trust or, uh, or has been disingenuous so far. So why should Kashmiris uh, be inclined towards that direction? Uh, also mentioned a very cru important aspect, where he he mentioned that Pakistan must be ready in terms of maneuverability. Uh, in order to support the hopes of resistant fighters in Kashmir, uh, which is again valid under international law, uh, it, it either has to choose passivity or readiness to find an out-of-the-box uh, diplomatic solution. He uh, mentioned the two um, track diplomacy of a peaceful settlement on the first uh, as the first priority basis, which he also very self-aware uh, in a in a very self-aware <laughs> manner he mentioned how um, that's not a solution and how uh, Pakistan should uh, should be ready to implement preventative and reactory, uh, reactive measures to prevent genocide in Kashmir. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your participation, Dr. Ulam uh, Nabifay. Um, thank you for your persistence and uh, of raising awareness and uh, across the world about Kashmiri struggle. Um, and, and thank you for recognizing this webinar and all the webinars pertaining to Kashmir and how uh, rightfully so, they will keep the engine running to debunk uh, the impression of the BGP government that Kashmir has reached the finish line uh, in terms of uh, the struggle of this for, for self-determination. You mentioned the statistics, uh, alarming statistics of 90 to 95 percent of our Kashmiris are uh, uh, voices are in, uh, toward, inclined towards the uh, accession towards Pakistan. You highlighted that the solution of Kashmir will come when we are ready to admit and internalize the lack of the better word uh, or uh, inadequacies in the policies regarding Kashmir. But also, you also mentioned the vigor and the and you commended the the vigor and effort of Pakistan in showing consistency and pers uh, persistence in the cause throughout the years. Um, you highlighted numerous uh, uh, violations of of, uh, of grotesque nature such as the uh, pellet gun attacks, um, <coughs> which are inhuman in its, in its nature, detentions, horrible conditions during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, leaving medical professionals helpless to, to facilitate uh, uh, patients. You also mentioned the crucial new development of the domicile laws and how it's, it's, it's strategically uh, in place for, to, um, to bring about uh, demographic change. Um, you also mentioned how 17 UN experts 
which is an alarming number uh, that India has restored the human rights of Kashmiris and in a systematic fashion, which is a very crucial point. Um, you mentioned how India disingenuinely uh, and uh, it, it kind of shows the guilty conscience of, Kashmir, uh, of in India uh, by denying the fact-finding request from the UN uh, uh, amongst many other things. You also mentioned how commercial aspects in the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic being uh, kind of an ultimate opportunistic avenue for India to cover its impunity uh, and, 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 uh, and injustices that it's committing in, in Kashmir and how commercial and economic matters sadly are taking priority, uh, are taking priority over basic human freedoms. How three nuclear powers are surrounding Kashmir and uh, the spillover effect if the international community does not uh, wake up from slumber, it would have uh, drastic and very irreparable damages uh, in terms of spillover effects across the globe. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Justice Ali Nawaz Johan. Uh, thank you for working with us day and night. Your credentials are immense and many you possess the energy and vigor that uh, put any youngster my age uh, to shame. Uh, you highlighted the occupation as an usurpation, you, the impact of practical nature, uh, which are grotesque with impunity, uh, covered with impunity. Uh, you mentioned how the big powers usually are vested powers. Uh, they create institutions to monitor uh, atrocities uh, when they see it fit. Uh, uh, evidence from the Nuremberg trials, the ICTR, the ICTY tribunals. Um, you mentioned how territorial disputes uh, usually sadly take a peaceful resolution first to avoid bloodshed. Uh, in a way, it's rightfully so, but at the same time, it show it's, it's not a tangible solution for Kashmir as it uh, of now because of its uh, contentious and uh, very uh, grave uh, manner at which it, at which it is uh, progressing. You highlighted the local standard with Pakistan pertaining to human rights issues, uh, which could be vicariously in, could could be brought up to the UN institutions and vicariously would invoke the territorial aspect of things. Uh, you mentioned national institutions of human rights and how uh, buildup of cases would put India's uh, uh, so-called peaceful democratic image at uh, at risk, and which would maybe force a, a somewhat. Uh, ease, uh, in uh, easing uh, of of the lockdown of the of the institutional injustices, uh, perhaps uh, forced by the hand of international communities' uh, criticism. Uh, you mentioned many other things about how out of the box solutions are the only avenues for us to to make sure. And you also mentioned how the Human Rights Commission and the Right to Information Commission, which is absent in the in the uh, post the abrogation and the Union Territory of Kashmir, the so-called Union Territory of Kashmir, you mentioned how there is none of the, there is no existence of those commissions, which also creates avenues of impunity, which is a case on its own. Uh, you are, uh, you mentioned how the Kashmiris should, would not take uh, going back po uh, post 5th August 2019 as a solution, a tangible solution, because of how distrusting Kashmiris have become as a whole. Uh, you mentioned a very important tragic, tragic case, uh, how international and inter whether it's an international or internal armed conflict, uh, war crimes are perpetuated by by Indians are still valid and are still uh, present uh, in the in Kashmir. Uh, I would also, with this, um, sorry for taking too long for summing up everything. I just wanted to uh, cover uh, all the points that you that you made. Um, if I was in any way wrong of, uh, in summing up all the points, I apologize freehand. Uh, it was a spectacle and pleasure to, to see such great minds come together on a single platform to discuss one of the most contentious, but also unprecedented conflicts of the modern times. With this, uh, I think, uh, again, thank you so much. Um, LFO VK uh, ends this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you once again, Dr. Saab. Thank you, Fai Saab. Thank you, uh, Chauhan Saab. And special thanks to Professor Dr. Mohammed Mishtar because uh, the Kashmiris were keenly, keenly watching the show. Thank you very much. So this will end this. Thank you.